we're on the way to the Dutch road. Yes. On a Tuesday when we're closed, we also have um, five collection maintenance technicians who are dusting our galleries. The horticulture team is turning over the courtyard. The gallery everything just looks so perfect. And then you don't realize how much expertise it takes. The ones that are coming in right now are the chimney bell flowers, which are these really tall. There's a little bit of a, a yard sale appearance here, mostly because a Tuesday when we need to access certain areas we can't get at, our art handlers have moved things aside. So everything is a, a little bit out of order over here, mostly so that we could access another part of the gallery. One of the components in a project like this is that we want to assess everything in the gallery. This is an opportunity for us to care for individual pieces as well as the gallery as a whole. And one of the pieces is quite high up and not well lit. And so we were having trouble determining whether or not it would need to be treated as a part of this project. Lucia, our paintings conservator, is going to go up and take a closer look. The object is called St. Martin and the Beggar. If somebody wants to find it on the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum website, that's what to look up. It's a story about a saint, St. Martin. In this story, he is renowned for having noticed that there was a poor man outside who was cold, and he divides his rich, warm cloak in half, and he gives it to that man. So that's what's happening here in this image. I didn't even notice the man at the bottom. I was so busy looking at the figure at the top. Exactly. But imagine, actually, if you were looking at it from a much lower angle. So the way that this is situated in the gallery, it's above the door, the door when you actually walk into the Dutch round. I'm not looking at it at the proper eye level. Exactly. So I think that part of what you're seeing is that there's a little bit of the foreshortening effect that they were planning for. So if you're looking at it from below, then you would have seen this figure as a little bit bigger than how we're seeing it. So we tend to use acrylic paints, modern acrylic. And there are a variety of different paints that we might use depending on which effect that we're looking for. Acrylics are really great. They fluoresce in a very specific way. So it's usually really easy to distinguish them from older oil-based paints, which is frequently what would have been used for objects like this. We're really lucky to have some old photographs of a lot of areas in the galleries and then sometimes specific objects like this from different points in history. So you're seeing this older photograph shows a lot of damage on the object. You can see all those white areas are areas of loss. Gardner really thought very carefully about every element. So the floor, the walls, the pieces that are in front of them, above them, it's all integral to her vision and to the way that she wanted us to experience these spaces. This is so unique to be a conservator at a museum which is not white walls. By restoring back to all of the original details, we're able to see what she wanted us to see. Gardner's will really is a piece of every part of this museum. That's absolutely true. So one of the things that she wrote in her will was that the collection was to remain for the education and enjoyment of the public forever. And we like to think that that's where conservation comes in. We're the forever part. So how do we preserve this collection as she intended forever. And so that's a big part of what we're doing here today. So these are the four different walls of the room. This is where the empty frames are. You can think about these niches. They each have one of the paintings. Here's the fireplace. All of this can be done to sort of keep her vision alive, even if you are physically taking down the old thing and putting up something new. This is the window where the Vermeer was, and then these are the windows that look out onto the garden. Each of these squares that you're seeing right here represents a different textile that was originally on the walls. Right now, it's all just one textile, but once upon a time it was 10, and they were cut into little pieces. And there were really cool conversations that we've kind of lost today. There's a sort of um, cool conversation that was happening in these really small vignettes. That nine textile right there, it was like a 1550s Italian damask. One thing we're really hoping to do with this project is to make those walls part of the whole work of art. This one right here, that's the textile around the fireplace. That's represented by the point one here, which is now also seen down here. 
all of these 10 images right here, these all refer to the 10 fabrics that were originally on the walls. I think the coolest one is five over here because she cut it into these little pieces. You can see how scrappy it is and she's flipping them around. So she's playing with how they reflect light. It's just a really unique moment. And so this is what I am most excited to see. Many people are familiar with the empty frames. This little section right here refers to the curtains that hang behind those paintings. This beautiful gold piece right here, that was originally a green color. And we don't know why, but behind this Rembrandt, there was an additional extra little shorty textile. During Mrs. Gardner's life, she actually swapped the placement of these two paintings. But originally, when this one was over here, you couldn't see the little shorty textile, but then she moved them. And with Lady and Gentleman over here, now you can see it. <laughs> 